Good morning. morning. Great to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, And what is is supposed to be 95 degrees today, I think. Uh, So anyways, uh, uh, get out early to avoid the heat. Uh, But uh, good uh, good to be together as always. A couple couple things to remind you of. One, Rob is not here this morning. He's visiting friends in Italy. So uh, we're uh, praying for him and uh, assuming he's having a great time over there. He'll be back next Sunday. Next Sunday, of course, is September 10th. We'll kick off the fall. Uh, The kids started school this past Friday. So we jump back into the routine this Tuesday and we'll uh, we'll kick things off uh, this next next Sunday, September 10th. Uh, Joyous Journey will be back on and we have renamed MP3. 20 years ago, people knew what an MP3 was. Now, the MP3, there's not a thing. It's not a thing anymore. So we've renamed the youth the Huddle. This is, uh, this is uh, what Rob and the kids that came up with. They, they reconfigured the youth room so it's more like a, a circle instead of a U-shape, and they're going to huddle. So anyways, that would be great. So Joyce Journey and the Huddle kicks off next Sunday. Um, Choir rehearsal begins this Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Sally would love for any of you to join to be part of, sorry, 7 o'clock. Rehearsal at 7 o'clock this this Wednesday, the 6th. Uh, Sally would love for you to be a part of that, and then the choir will be kicking off next Sunday. Uh, It will be good to have them back with us, but come join us for that. And then uh, after next Sunday, the following Sunday is September 17th, the celebration of our 40th anniversary and our church picnic and all of that. So we'd encourage you to to be a part of that as well uh, on the the, the 17th. Blessing of the Pets coming up on the 23rd, the next OCC Blood Drive on the 27th. Check out the Benevolence Box, uh, Hope House, Family Sharing, still opportunities to be involved. Check out the electronic bulletin for all of those, the prayer requests, um, and yeah, anything else I'm missing by the way of announcement this morning. Okay, well, good. Uh, again, good to, good to be together. And uh, we are so glad to have Dietrich and Megumi uh, back with us this morning. They are no strangers, of course. And their son, Lucas, is going to, to play along as well. And uh, we've got Max and Hans uh, with us too. So, uh, so glad to have the whole family with us. Thanks for coming. Yes, Sally. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Sally. Sorry I missed that. The Women's Fellowship, uh, the, the 21st, I think it is, Thursday the 21st at Mimi Meads, and a sign-up sheet in Fellowship Hall or talk to Sally. So, yes, great. I uh, will announce that again next week, too. So, good. Uh, Dietrich and Megumi are going to play our prelude for us. So, let's take a minute to open our minds and our hearts to the Lord as we enter into worship.
Thank you. Thank you. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. Uh, beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you. Uh, I think we celebrate the faithfulness of the Lord uh, once a month. Of course, we celebrate it every Sunday, but once a month as we observe the sacrament of communion, which we do on the first Sunday of every month. Uh, we here in the congregational tradition, we observe two sacraments that we believe Christ left for us. The first is baptism, and the second is the Lord's Supper or communion. Uh, and here in the congregational tradition, we observe what is known as open communion. That, we, that is, we believe that everyone is welcome at the table of the Lord. This is not our table. It's not congregationalism's table. It's not any particular church. It belongs to the Lord, and everyone is welcome at it. And so we invite you to participate this morning with us. And what you're doing by participating is you are uh, remembering the suffering of Christ for us. And you are identifying yourself with it in some way. And in some way, you are proclaiming it to uh, one another and to the world. And so we invite you to, to participate with us this morning as we observe the sacrament. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this body, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, all of you who drink it, in remembrance of me. Some years later, the Apostle Paul told us that whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And here we continue to observe this, this sacrament, this sacred ritual that reminds us of the love of God that we see represented in Christ's suffering and death for us. And uh, so uh, we invite you to participate with us this morning. Let's pray. God, we are grateful. We are grateful for your love given to us freely. Lord, we are grateful that you would love us enough that you would sacrifice yourself on our behalf to give us hope, to deal with our condition, to defeat the power of death, to give us the hope of eternal life, to give us here in this life the reminder that you are with us, that you walk alongside us, that you feel our pain and you celebrate with us in our joy that you know what it's like to be us, that you give us in this life hope and meaning that is uh, intrinsic to the world and yet is also beyond the world. And uh, so, Lord, the, uh, this morning as we remember again the, the sacrifice of Christ for us, uh, we acknowledge our need of you. We acknowledge our need of your love for us. We acknowledge that it is you who created us. It is you who sustains us and you who gives us ultimate hope. And so I pray that again, this, this, this sacrament, this sacred ritual would be a reminder of your love for us and would again give us hope. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the deacons uh, forward.
body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. After that first Lord's Supper that Jesus observed with his disciples, uh, it, they went out to the Mount of Olives afterwards. But before they went out to the Mount of Olives, it said... They sang a hymn. So we're going to sing a hymn this morning. So uh, let's stand together. We're going to sing number 248, How Firm a Foundation. Uh, you can see the lyrics up there or turn to it if you like, but we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. So... Stress. 
the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amen. You may be seated. I like those the words in verse 3. When through the deep waters I call thee to go. We all go through difficult times. We all go through deep waters sometimes, right? The rivers of woe shall not thee overflow. We need to trust that God is going to sustain us in that. Do you remember, uh, or if you uh, said, you know, somebody participating in a race, a, a swimming race, and his parents was, were watching, and... He said, I, I knew two things, that they wanted me to su succeed and they weren't going to let me drown. I thought that was good, you know. And, hey, life, uh, life is tough sometimes and it comes to an end for all of us at, at some point. But what we trust is God wants us to succeed and he's not going to let us drown. That's good. For I will be near thee, thy troubles to bless. Ah, we don't think of that very often, that God is going to bless our troubles. Right? Or maybe bring something good out of our troubles. And sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. That, that God is going to sanctify, he's going to make holy, he's going to bring good out of our deepest distress. Right? That maybe we see God even in that. So anyways, those are uh, maybe some good reminders. So let's pray together again. God, we trust that, that... That you, you and your love for us is a firm foundation in the midst of life and the troubles that we go through. We trust that you are with us, that you are near us, and that even you bring good out of the bad. Uh, you'll sanctify even our deepest distress. And that ultimately you bring about victory, even in the face of death, for all of us. And so we're, we are grateful for that. And uh, so we rejoice in the opportunity to gather again this morning as we unite our hearts together, praying in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yes, come play for us again.
Thank you, thank you. A beautiful song, that Ave Maria. Uh, you've heard that before. I, one time in our church in Canada, we had a, a special musician, or a special singer, he was a singer, and uh, he sang, and afterwards the, the preacher got up and was like, I think that's the sermon for today, and just <laughs> left it at that. But, so anytime Dietrich Magumi and Lucas, I think, ah, I don't need to preach, that was great. So thank you all, thank you. Um, or that's at least the good news for this week. Uh, you know, if uh, you're with us, we do this segment regularly called This Week's Good News. Uh, and the, the good news this week, it was actually from a couple weeks ago, but I, uh, I don't know if you saw this on the news. I do it again in a heartbeat. Eastern Michigan football player gives his scholarship to teammate. Here's the next slide there. For the last four years, Zach Conti has juggled going to school with holding down multiple jobs, all while playing football at Eastern Michigan University. And his hard work was noticed. To cover his tuition and bills, He's been taking on landscaping, home demo jobs, while also dealing with uh, recent news that his mother needs to find a kidney, kidney donor. He shared with teammates he was thinking about quitting the team, and his fellow offensive lineman, Brian Dooley, didn't want to see him give up his passion. And uh, so Dooley, in his last year of eligibility, gave his scholarship to this teammate of his, both offensive linemen. Uh, I mean, and he says it felt uh, unbelievable. What an amazing... It's a right uh, act of generosity. And uh, so uh, that was the, the good news this week. One other thing I saw, five-year-old's lemonade stand in Seattle raised over $17,000 for victim of Miami wildfires. Wow. They were watching the news about it, and he started asking about it, this five-year-old kid, about the people over there and, and this kind of thing. And, and then he was like, well, maybe we could do a lemonade stand and raise some money. And so he puts on this little lemonade stand and they <clears throat> sold cotton candy and a couple things too. And then some businesses con contributed and yet, yeah, ah, $17,000, right? Uh, I mean, of course, any lemonade stand, I know there's a neighbor down our, our street that she collects uh, donations for family services every year and she's been doing it for five years and all these things that, that kids do, uh, uh, that's amazing, that's amazing. So anyways, that's this week's good news, so. Good morning. Good morning. This uh, first scripture reading is from Ecclesiastics chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him.
Our second scripture reading comes today from Colossians chapter 3. Since, then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you, Gisela. Thank you. Good passage there. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Another rendering of that verse says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working unto the Lord. I think that's a, an important thing. Now, we're going to take a little break today from our look at the scripture's use of the number 40. We'll, of course, get back to that in the next couple weeks. Uh, and instead, talk about Labor Day. Labor Day seems to get overlooked, I feel like, at least in comparison to our observation of some of the other national holidays that we have. It gets overshadowed by, by the back to school, of course, and, and the end of summer and all of that. But Labor Day is really important because I think it's important that we appreciate the work that people do. And I think it's important that we find meaning and satisfaction as Ecclesiastes reminds us, find satisfaction in our work, that this is from the hand of God, that we find in it not only a contribution to humanity and to society, but that maybe it finds a greater meaning in our work's service to God. Maybe we find a deeper meaning in it. I think that's important. It makes a difference in the way we look at the people and the way we look at the world and the way we look at ourselves. So... Labor Day. You can find the history of Labor Day on the U.S. Department of, of Labor's website. Uh, anybody know that the first state to recognize a Labor Day? First state. Anybody? It was Oregon. Oregon. Uh, in 1887, I think it was. And then that year, a few other states had done it. But the first parade was New York City, 1882. If uh, I think there's a, it's coming. Sometimes these, the, the delay is sticks. But anyways, 1882, the parade in New York City. It was quite the spectacle, uh, uh, apparently. And then anybody know what day, when did it become a national holiday? What year did it become a national holiday? 1894 became a national holiday on June 28th, signed into law by President Grover Cleveland, Labor Day. Interesting. First Monday in September. But did you know also that there is a Labor Hall of Honor that, that people get inducted to it, like a sort of a Hall of Fame for Labor Day? Uh, you can find this too on the, on the Department of uh, Labor's website. The Labor Hall of Honor recognizes individuals and groups whose distinctive contributions to the field of labor have enhanced the quality of life of millions. I mean, this is what Labor Day does, recognizes the contribution of workers to America and to, to America's strength and prosperity. So this is sort of a, a Hall of Fame. The most recent inductee, 2022, the essential workers of the coronavirus pandemic. Interesting. So you won't recognize 
a lot of the names on the list, but there were a few that were interesting. Uh, a guy whose name you'll recognize, Charles R. Walgreen. Yes, founder of Walgreens. We believe that honest goods can be sold to honest people by honest methods. Charles Rudolph Walgreen founded Walgreen Company, the global pharmacy chain. They emphasized customer service and friendliness combined with prof professionalism. He was a great innovator. He put a soda fountain in Walgreens, which was a big thing at the time. And in 1920, one of Walgreens employees invented the milkshake. The most important thing of all. Most important thing of all. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, that was Charles Walgreen. Anybody recognize the name John Commons? John R. Commons, maybe? This is the first great problem of modern democracy, how to get a fair living by reasonable hours of work, leaving enough for leisure both for childhood and manhood. John R. Commons of the University of Wisconsin was a creative force behind innovative concepts of social legislation involving trade unionism and collective bargaining. Commons was known as the spiritual father of social security. Virtually all progressive social and labor legislation enacted in the 20th century can be attributed to him. How about that? He was, I think, the second inductee into the Labor Hall of Fame in 1988, uh, I think. Maybe it was 78, I can't remember. There was one before him, the year before him, and then him. So here are our own John R. Commons from the University of Wisconsin made a difference. Interesting. But I mean, here's, here's the thing we're trying to do. And I think this is the thing that the labor is trying to do, the Department of Labor. How do we find a, a, a balance between work and leisure? How do we reward work done in a reasonable amount of time that leaves room for both uh, childhood and adulthood leisure? How do we find a balance in life? We can easily focus too much on work. We work too much and we neglect responsibilities to family and to friends and neglect the need for rest. Uh, or we can find no meaning in it all. The only reason I'm working is to, so that I can fund my leisure activities, that I don't find any meaning or significance in, in the work that I do, my contribution to, to society. And this is part of the reason that we have labor unions and labor activists. The part of the reason for Labor Day is how do we create reasonable working conditions, right, so people have this balance in life, particularly for people for whom work is really physically demanding, requires a lot of labor. How do we create uh, positive conditions and positive hours? I mean, you can look these things up. What are the most dangerous jobs out there? What are the most dangerous jobs out there? Anybody have a guess? Fishing. 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 That's number one. Construction is on there. Coal mining is, uh, is not in the top five, but it's in the top 10. Mining's in the top 10. But fishing and hunting, let's start there. Fishing uh, is one of the most dangerous jobs out there. And uh, Gail can probably tell you it, difficult conditions being out on Lake Michigan. I know Rob Raskowitz can tell you that. Uh, it's, it's a demanding and dangerous, dangerous job. We, our church in Texas, we supported some missionaries in the Bahamas. You gotta serve the Lord somewhere, it might as well be the Bahamas, you know? <laughs> so we, would, we went down there to visit, uh, you know, and there's lots of islands in the Bahamas, it's amazing. I always say that I feel like I have a, a healthy, maybe not so healthy, fear of the ocean. I mean, the ocean is incredibly massive, massive and intimidating. And some people in the Bahamas, maybe they feel that too, uh, in the Bahamas on the islands, I mean, you are never more than a half a mile from the ocean. And there are some Bahamians, they haven't been in the ocean in 20 years. They just, they don't go in the ocean. I, I don't know. But we, we visited our missionaries down there. There's one island called Spanish Wells, which is on the north side. It's an island off the north side of the island of Eleuthera, which is a bigger island. And Spanish Wells, one of its big industries is lobster fishing. And so fishermen will go out for months at a time and they spend all sorts of hours scuba diving under the water, e either laying traps or checking traps. 
And they might spend one day in the water and then they'll spend a day on the boat and they kind of alternate. I mean, just getting beaten by the salt water and the waves and the sun. I mean, it is grueling. And so in Spanish wells, the churches that are there, uh, before the, the fishing season, they will have a, a fisherman's farewell service before the, the fishermen go and they pray for the safety of, it's amazing. But if you eat lobster at a restaurant, this is how it comes. Somebody set a trap and somebody found, you know, caught a lobster. I mean, it's amazing. Yes, loggers, uh, I think is the next one. Logging workers, you can envision that that is a really dangerous job. We cut down some trees here. Craig Campbell has cut down some trees for us, but we also hired another guy named Rustin, who was a friend of Rip's. He cut down the four big trees uh, down here. Maybe Craig cut one of them. But anyways, if you don't know what you're doing cutting down a tree, it is really dangerous. And Rustin being out there with a tiny little tractor and cutting it down, I mean, I don't want to be anywhere near that. It is really, really dangerous. Number three, roofers you can imagine, is a dangerous occupation. Uh, construction workers, construction workers. I always think about these guys out here on 43, right? I mean, uh, uh, amazing. And structural iron and steel workers. Uh, these are sort of the top five. There's a top 10, and depending on the list that you look at, they might be in a little bit different orders. Logging workers sometimes are number one, and uh, all of this, but um, yeah. And yet these are so important, these jobs, right? There's, th there are all sorts of people out there doing work, enabling our society to function. And we need those people, right? You think of construction workers. You, you remember this picture, 1932. Construction workers sitting over top of New York City. They, they're 800 feet in the air. 800 feet in the air. And they staged the picture as sort of a publicity thing. So, it, you know, they didn't regularly go out there to eat their lunch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sort of become this iconic picture that, of course, is amazing. The, the work that, that these people do. Uh, they, they recreated it. Some people have recreated the, the picture. <laughs> this was 2019, I think, or... Uh, but, I mean, again, amazing, right? It is amazing. Yeah. And I just think it's really important that we appreciate the work that people do. And that we see, find meaning in our own work, right? In society, we, we tend to, even though these are some of the dangerous jobs, we tend to value certain work more than other. We t tend to to devalue other work. And, and some of these that are really dangerous jobs, you know, we don't tend to value them quite as much, perhaps, as we ought. And I think, at least for me, finding meaning in our work, not just as a contribution to humanity, but also as service to God, I think will change the way you look at people and your circumstances and yourself. Humanity tends to value certain things and devalue other things, value certain occupations, devalue other occupations. But the love of God makes us all equal. The love of God, our need of it and our reception of it, it makes us all equal. It will change your perspective. It will change the way you look at the world and the way you look at others and the way you look at yourself. I know we say this all the time, but I think it's so important. The love of God... It will transform the way you look at the waiter at lunch today if you go out to a restaurant. The love of God will remind you this is not just a waiter here to serve me. This is a real person going through whatever they're going through, fulfilling this role in society and in need of and a recipient of the love of God. And how do I treat them? There's some... Uh, bosses out there when hiring people they'll take people to dinner and a, a big a plus or a big red flag is how that person treats the waiter right i think it it the love of god transforms the way we look at people sometimes we look at the construction workers out there uh, these and we can tend to 
to think of the inconvenience of all the construction and ah, when are they going to get this thing done and all of that. And yet I think it's important that we appreciate the work that those people do. We got a, an email, this is probably a couple, few months ago, where they were doing some work here, but they were bringing in a big machine. And so she emailed and said, somebody from the, the DOT, or I, I can't remember who it was, and she said, hey, would it be okay if our workers parked in your parking lot on this particular day because this big machine is coming in, they can't park on the road or whatever. So I emailed her back and said, yeah, hey, certainly. No, they, they can park in our lot. I said, man, it's, it's fun to see the work coming together. And I said that you guys can keep traffic going as well as you do is amazing, you know? And she emailed back and just like, hey, thanks so much for your kind words. Right? I mean, I'm sure they hear a lot of complaints uh, more than they do kind words, you know? I think it's important that we appreciate the work that people do. Again, the love of God will transform the way you look at the world and the way you look at other people. The way you look at the waiter, the way you look at the construction worker, the way you look at the person who comes to your house to fix the plumbing or whatever it is. I, I think it's so important. And it will change the way you look at yourself and the meaning you find in your own work, the meaning you find in what you do. Because I think as a contribution to humanity, I think you find a, a means of, a, of satisfaction there. And in your work's service to God as part of something that transcends the world, I think changes the way you look at yourself and the meaning that you find in what you do. Anybody recognize the names Bezalel and Oholiab? We didn't read this passage this morning. I didn't want to give Gisela too many difficult names. <laughs> but remember, we mentioned last week that the Israelites, uh, they, they met at Mount Sinai. They organized themselves. They designated the Le Levites as the priests. And they built the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this temple that they, they wandered around the desert. They, they would eventually build the permanent temple in Jerusalem. But while they were wandering in the desert, they had this, this temple that they called the tabernacle that they could pack up and move with them. And Bezalel and Oholiab were the builders of the tabernacle and the, the artifacts that were part of that and the Ark of the Covenant that you, you remember where the presence of God dwelt. They don't get the recognition that King David and King Saul and Dave, or, uh, Daniel and all these other figures that we recognize from the Bible. But their work contributed significantly to the Israelites and to the difference that God made. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, some son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Uh, oh, their contribution to things, their contribution to the children of Israel, it's significant, huh? Right down to the job description. Right down to the job description, absolutely. <laughs> Cutting stone, all of that. I think the, the assigning to your work Doing it not just for men, but for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with heart, all your heart as working unto the Lord. Changes the way you look at yourself and what you do and the meaning that it has and the satisfaction you find in it. Both as a contribution to humanity and also in service to the Lord. I think we all ask the question at times, ah, what am I doing what is the work that I'm doing? Is it important? Is it significant? What am I doing with my life? Kind of thing. And yet I think whatever we do, whatever you're involved in, your contribution to humanity and your service to God is important. And I hope that you find a measure of satisfaction in that. I emailed with my younger brother uh, this week. Maybe it was last week. He sent out a note to all our cousins we have 
something on my dad's side called the Larson uh, Electronic Eagle. And, and so we will send out an update on our lives to all our cousins on my dad's side. And some, you know, it's just good to keep up with things. So, so uh, my younger brother, Eric, sent out uh, a note, it was either this week or last week, uh, to the Larson Eagle, to all the cousins, to give an update on his life. And uh, one of the things he said was this. I am back engineering full-time for the company I was with before, Delta T Consultants. With work, I seem to be plagued by a constant, what am I doing with my life, question. At times I enjoy what I do, but often yearn for greener pastures doing who knows what else that would be more fulfilling. Perhaps that is most people, but I can tend to ruminate on it often. Sometimes Julie and I talk about moving to rural Europe somewhere and gardening. For now, though, I am continuing on designing mechanical systems for commercial buildings. He's a mechanical engineer. Right. So I, uh, I emailed him back and just said, I know the what am I doing with my life question plagues us all at times, but designing mechanical systems for commercial buildings is not an insignificant contribution to the world. Not that there might not be another spot for you someday, but as one who too seldom recognizes the benefits I receive from engineering's contributions to the world, let me say I'm grateful for them. I hope there's some satisfaction for you from your involvement in it. I just talked in church Sunday about the invention of air conditioning and the incredible improvement it has made to people's lives. The migration south, the increase in people's health, slow, slowing the spread of disease. It was an engineer who created that marvel, engineer, other engineers who kept it going and made it affordable, and still others who continue to improve it. It is amazing what humanity has created, and it's necessary to the economy and to people's lives for others to carry it forward. So, you know, I mean, I, obviously, I want my younger brother to find satisfaction in his work. And he, he's in a spot where he doesn't really know about God and what does he think about that and blah, blah, blah. And I, all I want to say to him is, hey, what you do and who you are is significant and important. And I appreciate it. At least I, I too seldom, I too seldom appreciate the work that people like him do that, and you don't think about riding the elevator in the, the building you go in, right? Or that it's structurally sound because some engineer made it structurally sound, right? These things that we just take for granted. And yet I think it's, it's important that we appreciate them. And, and as I, as he, as we see ourselves, not just here in service to the world, but ultimately in service to God, I think it makes a difference in the way we look at the world, in the way we look at others, in the way we look at ourselves. So... Happy Labor Day. Yes. Let's pray. God, we are thankful, uh, thankful for this world that you have given us, for the jobs you have given us in it, for the roles that we can play. Lord, and help us in, in, uh, in the times that we feel like that. Ah, what am I doing with my life? Or what have I done with my life? Help us to uh, realize uh, the, the importance of the role that we play. Help us to realize the importance of the role that others play and uh, to be grateful uh, for them, to be uh, grateful for what you have given us and the chance that you have given us to be a part of it. So thank you for uh, this weekend, for all the people that work so tirelessly to make our country and to make our world what it is. Lord, we trust that you somehow are a part of each one and each one's work. Uh, so, Lord, thank you for this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to end with the song, Count Your Blessings. Count your blessings. When upon life's billows you are temp <laughs> tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your blessings, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So let's stand together as we sing. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done.
count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. I think we're going to leave it there. One verse was good. One verse was good. I see it's already 1030. You, you've got to do your best to let people out early on a, on a holiday weekend, you know, and I've, we've already failed. So take a seat, take a seat, uh, because um, I hope you join us for coffee and conversation afterwards. But I know you're going to want to stay for uh, Dietrich and, and Megumi and Lucas are going to play our postlude. Okay, so uh, maybe this is one post that we, we stay and listen for and then uh, listen to. And then I hope you'll join us for, for coffee and conversation uh, afterwards. So thank you so much for coming.